meeting uh, is recorded. Uh, and there it would be an audio recording available for uh, any future use. So just to get the meeting started, I'm gonna go for a roll call vote. Uh, Tom Hansel is present. Ken Anderton. Ken Anderton is present. Kenny Staffenson. Kenny Staffenson present. Uh, SDIC board is present. Uh, Emily, any public testimony today? Nope. Thank you. So I, I just wanna ask if we can try to uh, stay on schedule today. Uh, there's some commitments of some board members. We're trying to uh, manage our time well today. So uh, no uh, offense to staff, but we're just trying to uh, uh, hold to our times as best we can. So uh, Carrie, uh, you're presenting on environmental briefing. Yes, I am. Very glad to be here. Carrie Sandeman, I'm the Environmental Program Manager, and I also manage the Planning Department. I will, oh, I can't, Emily, I can't share my screen. Let me fix that. Okay. So I've been with the district about 18 months now. Uh, September of 2019 was the beginning of it, and this is, uh, I think I've, I've been to see you before, but never to provide this kind of briefing on the environmental program as it's coming to be and where we see it headed. So you're going to hear some pretty broad themes about what the environmental program is doing for MCDD and for the district's SDIC that we serve, what some of the natural resources context and challenges and opportunities that that sits within are. And then near the end, we're gonna talk about a staff recommendation to develop a high level environmental policy that sets the sideboards and provides guidelines for staff in making decisions related to the environment and natural resources. Uh, we'll dive right in. So start with the why. Why have an environmental program? It is good business. We are an agency and SDIC moves water around and anytime we move water around and operate within stream channels, we are in a pretty complicated web of environmental regulation. And so being intentional, being strategic, being expert at how we navigate that web is something that keeps us on time and on schedule, helps us deliver the conveyance and flood safety services that the, the districts provide. For MCDD, it is an organizational value to consider our impact on the environment. So that is not saying that we always choose the most protective or conservative choice, but that we understand what some of the impacts are of the actions we take and act accordingly. And I think this is particularly important because all the drainage districts act in a network of partnerships with the public, with our NGO and community groups and with our agency partners. And so being able to have a clear and thoughtful understanding of how we're making decisions with relation to natural resources keeps our relationships with them strong since many do hold personal or organizational values related to the environment. And the last is that it's where we're headed. The Urban Flood Safety and Water Quality District has amongst its purposes to contribute to improved water quality, fish and wildlife habitat, floodplain restoration, and landscape resilience. Now that's not the agency that we are today, uh, but there are opportunities within our current projects and within our current authorities to build the kind of processes and expertise amongst our staff that provide a bridge to the agency that we will be. So there, there is a connection there as well. And when I say environment, I'm sure you've seen this map and this slide in a bunch of contexts before, but when I say environment in this case, I wanna talk a little bit more about what I mean. It's a word that has a lot of connotations to a lot of people and um, you know, some good, some bad, but let's, let's get specific. What do we mean by environment and natural resources in this place and in relation to the work that we do? So what is now the managed floodplain? Since time immemorial was a dynamic network of channels and wetlands and lakes. 
Also, since time immemorial, Native people have lived and utilized natural resources and managed natural resources in this place and continue to today. Dr. David Lewis, in the format that's coming up, will provide a lot more information about this. So I'm just gonna, gonna leave it at that for now. But in the 100 years since the levees were installed, this managed floodplain has gone through some tremendous transformation from being that dynamic network of wetlands and streams and lakes to being an agricultural landscape to being the mix of commercial and residential and industrial land that we have today. And I think one of the ways, a, for me, useful framework to think about how that hundred years of transformation shows up today is this is uh, the city of Portland's watershed report card. So I recognize we're not in the city of Portland, uh, but they are looking at the Columbia Slough watershed. And, and so I, I think it still brings out some themes that are really useful uh, for SDIC in the portion of the Columbia Slough watershed uh, that's in SDIC. I think you'll see that all the themes I'm about to highlight are, are applicable even outside the city. So the scores are for hydrology, water quality, habitat, and fish and wildlife. The hydrology score as a C plus is really reflecting the fact that for portions of the watershed, including SDIC, the flow is heavily managed by pumps. On the other hand, the flow is in open channels. And in a lot of urban watersheds, that's not true. You might have streams that are entirely underground or in pipes or channelized and in concrete channels. So you see both of those factors showing up here. And also the lower portion of the slough is open to tidal influence. Now that B minus is, is to me a pretty hopeful score because for a massive portion of the 20th century, the slough was a place that takes waste away, or at least that's what we thought. Uh, sewage treatment, or sorry, lack of sewage treatment sewage discharge, uh, industrial uses, untreated stormwater. There's a legacy of all of these things in the sediments uh, of the slough and in the sediments of, of the ditches in our, our district. However, there has been now many, many decades of the Clean Water Act, of wastewater treatment, of uh, treatment for stormwater that has made huge gains and um, DEQ's cleanup program as well. Habitat and fish and wildlife habitat, those scores are all pretty low, reflecting the fact that, including in SDIC, there is essentially a fish passage barrier. Uh, migratory fish can't make it into uh, the watershed, particularly with the gravity outfalls closed. Um, and if they did, the water quality, while it has been on a uh, trajectory for improvement, still has really low oxygen and high temperatures, which is really tough for those fish. And they very likely would not survive if they did make it in. And then in terms of terrestrial or land-based species, now I picked this photo because I think it, it shows that you know, there's, there, when we have, when we prioritize our land use for industrial, residential, for port properties and others, we do have less space for critters uh, to live on the landscape. So we're seeing the effects of that balance and those land use decisions show up in the watershed health scores. Now I'm gonna go through on more of a resource by resource basis and highlight some of the ways that our crew interact with the natural environment. Uh, the riparian vegetation, those are forests that happen next to streams. They tend to be very ecologically important in terms of improving water quality and providing habitat for fish and, and wildlife. They can be challenging for us when we want to access the waterway to remove blockages and also by creating blockages by falling into the water or giving fodder for the beavers who want to push them into the water. And, um, and also we're very limited on the levees in terms of the kind of vegetation that we can have under core standards. On the flip side, where we do have real shady, nice riparian forests, we see fewer weeds and lower water temperatures. And weeds are, aquatic weeds are something that can really clog our pump stations. They add extra work for the crew and strain potentially on the pump. Um, it's also a number of, I'd call them uh, un, uninvited guests 
in the plant land. Uh, most people are familiar with Himalayan blackberry. It can also form dense enough stands that it's pretty impossible to get to the water in certain places if we aren't mowing and maintaining. Uh, and then I mentioned some of the aquatic invasives and the impact they can have. They also, the aquatic plants tend to also really damage water quality because when they die seasonally and decompose, it sucks up all the oxygen in the water, which makes it, again, that much harder for fish uh, to survive. There are five species of reptiles in the slough watershed. Top right, the slider is uh, another uninvited guest, and the, the two on the left are our native turtles. Um, there's a, a large population in between Pen2 and MCDD, not that I'm aware of in, in SDIC. 12 native species of fish. I mentioned the, our salmon friends, uh, which someone once told me that the Pacific Northwest was an entire region that most closely identified with a fish, uh, but salmon tend to be a pretty big factor in all things environmental regulation in, in our part of the world. And so if we're ever doing work below the ordinary high water line on the Columbia side or in the lower slough, we have to work with the National Marine Fisheries Service and it's an extra layer of expense and effort to make sure that we're not impacting these species. The other place it comes into play, and you'll see when in future months when we talk about the gravity outfalls in SDIC, is in the idea of whether or not passage is provided for those fish is another um, heavily regulated area that we navigate. Furry friends, Again, the beaver of here is our most uh, mischievous and has the number of uh, goals counterproductive to ours in that they love to slow water down and uh, stop it from flowing through the system and they love to put trees down in the water. And so it's something that the crew navigates very, very frequently is, is figuring out how to live with beaver because they also provide a lot of good environmental services um, if we can coexist. Bats, we really don't do anything with bats, but I thought these were some pretty adorable pictures and maybe we have some of the cuter bats in the world. And I wanted to thank, this slide always reminds me to thank the Watershed Council. I took these slides, uh, Max Samuelson provided them to me and just really appreciate their support as I've gotten started here. And then birds are the last one I'll mention. So the streaked horn lark in the bottom middle is another endangered species. Broughton Beach and the PDX airfield are two of the locations uh, where we see the streaked horn lark. There are others. Um, Anna's hummingbirds are show up at the office and, and all over the districts, especially if you put out a little bit of sugar water for them. And great blue heron nest in the area. There are over 200 species of birds that a skilled observer can see in any given year. And it's one of the ways in which people often are fairly easy to interact with the natural environment and interact with wildlife as in bird watching and, and bird listening. And I guess what I hope you take away, because that's sort of the end of my quick tour to natural resources is one that our districts are a place that have absorbed a lot of environmental impact over over the last hundred years, and they're also a place with a lot of life. Floodplains are naturally resilient because they do have the proximity and, and availability of the water, and so there's a lot of wonderful places for recreation, for wildlife to live, as well as, and this is really a, a place where we balance. Um, we balance the environment, we balance our human, economic, and community needs. The other thing uh, that I'll emphasize is that there are a number of environmental justice issues, ways in which communities of color or low income individuals are disproportionately impacted by the environmental impacts uh, that are challenges in our region. For instance, when we have those heavily developed landscapes and we have fewer trees, we have higher highs on our hot days that can be dangerous uh, for people without AC in terms of heat related illness or, or hospitalization. Now I'm going to go next into the environmental services and successes and the policy, but I, I'll pause there and, and see if there are any questions. All right, hearing none, I shall, I shall 
bash forward. Uh, you had in your packet a quick summary of these services and some examples of them. These are things that the district has been doing since prior to my arrival here and the designation of an environmental program. So I have been able to consolidate and um, be strategic and, and plan around delivering them. These are all things that help us deliver the work we do under our current authorities. Right? So they make us faster, better, more thoughtful uh, in terms of delivering drainage and flood safety services. Uh, they're specifically you know, designed to be that. So permitting and regulatory coordination is a must. It's a legal thing we have to do. Uh, we evaluate environmental strategies, track natural resource projects. So those are cases they might be mitigating for impacts or they might be cases where we can work with nature to get where we're going a little bit better providing an environmental resource and also providing a point of contact with our, our partners. I'll highlight just a few successes. The first is we have and continue to maintain programmatic permits, which means they cover a bunch of routine activities like the sloughing of a bank of a ditch. We don't have to go through a three month permitting process for the crew to regrade that bank. We have that covered. We know what the conditions are. We pay one permit fee every couple years instead of doing it every time something comes up. Makes it a lot faster and easier and more efficient to deliver those kinds of things. Because again, anything that happens in a ditch, in a waterway is regulated by, I was gonna say at least two, but it's at least, <laughs> at least four agencies, right? So getting some of that stuff done and, and out of the way. And something I've been doing is continually educating our uh, staff on what those conditions are so they're aware ahead of time. We're continuing to build out the templates and examples that make that, that process rigorous and consistent. We have best management practices for turtles and, and beavers. And uh, I mean, fingers crossed, we're, we're hitting some bumps on the road as you always do, but we hope to potentially translocate beaver from SDIC this summer into some BLM lands, which means we've gone through all our different steps of trying to live with them on the land. Uh, and so we would re potentially remove them to a facility at the zoo where they get veterinary care and then they would go out onto the landscape as part of an ecological restoration project in another watershed. Um, so again, still in development, but if it, if it goes, it's a, it's a win-win and a good story of how do we do the best we can to live with wildlife. And I'll skip over the mapping and controlling of aquatic weeds, which is primarily in Pen2 and MCDD right now. Okay, so sticking with trying to keep us on track, I wanna to move to this last piece, which is the discussion of what's next. Um, the recommendation from myself and in coordination with Pegity is to begin the development of an environmental policy. And that would happen over the next nine to uh, 10 months and in collaboration with hopefully a, an advisor for our work group from each of the boards possible. Come back to the district boards in August with a draft of that and then continue to, to work towards refining it. Ideally, we would have one policy for all the districts so that we have consistent guidelines for our staff and how they're acting. And I, I want to emphasize that while this will be, I think, foundational for the new district to see what do we do today, it is a policy that is about being rooted in our authorities and the limitations of our authorities right now. Um, and so it's going to support the fundamental work of the drainage districts in permitting, evaluating the solutions based on our current needs, and providing guidelines for staff going forward high level sideboards and, and policies is, or excuse me, priorities is what we're imagining. And my last slide is just to say, we, we don't need a resolution, but we are looking for informal approval to move forward and, and develop this and, and volunteers as available to work with me on that. Thanks so much, Carrie. Uh, very informative. Uh, kind of, it's a good reminder of our uh, interconnection with the environment and our levees and our ditches and pumps, et cetera. Uh, you're you're reminding us of the, you know the 
urban the urban's role in really uh, grabbing a hold of the environmental work and moving that work forward. Uh, so I guess I'm 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 a little uh, it's, it's just going to be uh, keeping in step with the urban's direction and just maintaining what we have responsibilities for today. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how we're able to start this knowing that it's going to be taken over by the urban. Uh, so I'm just that, that's going to be an interesting uh, transition. Tani or Ken, do you have any comments? Or either you want to volunteer for that uh, assignment, you know, policy development? No, but I think it's great work. And I it's, it's going to be more and more important as we move into the new district mission. And it's great to get a head start on it because we're already getting those questions uh, as an organization of how are you pivoting to, to the new direction. Um, so good job, Carrie. Uh, good analysis. I, I would love to volunteer, but I've, I've also volunteered for some other things on MCD. So I think my plate's fairly full at this point. Thanks, Ken. Um, would there be a budget impact to this? Uh, to having a policy? Mm -hmm. To no. developing a policy. Oh, to developing a policy. Uh, the plan is to do that work with existing staff time and um, legal support from Hong. So it's it is something that I would spend time doing, but um, not anything. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how that's been handled in the past, say with the asset management policy. Peggy, you're on mute. I anticipate that this is really um, an extension of the work that Carrie's already working on and is not an additional um, is, is an addition to the existing budget. What I really see is that it's actually going to save us money because we're going to be centralized and working on something that is that is applicable across all four districts and which provide the groundwork necessary for us to be a more standardized approach to these environmental concerns that are, that are impacting our basic work we do now. I also see that so, this is great effort and that it lifts and helps to be, support the work that the environmental committee um, with a new district is going to need, but having a foundation for them is gonna be very useful. Danny, was that a, a request to volunteer for this board? Was I was going to nominate you for that, actually. So, Carrie, what's when is the uh, board starting up, and and is it is it essential? I mean, we only have a three member board. There are other commitments, yeah. uh, and I'm just trying to recognize: is there uh, opportunities for us to kind of check in without fully participating in the board? Yes, there definitely is. I, I think this is something that I, I would hope to use the board members time extremely sparingly to make sure that we're on the right track and we understand what the priorities are at, at strategic points. Um, but yes, I'd be happy to say, just check in with someone individually um, to make sure I'm on the right track as opposed to as part of a standing work group or anything to really minimize that. And I would love to not come back in August to this board and have you see, have no one on this board have seen anything between now and then, um, but anything I can do to minimize the workload, I'm happy to. Oh, go ahead, Tammy. I was gonna say, I'll, I'll volunteer since I'm on the other board. Oh, from the urban standpoint. Oh, a twofer. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you. Okay. I think that's what I'm looking for. I really appreciate y'all's time today and um, the ability to, to keep this going. I think, yeah, it'll be a lot of benefit for staff in understanding how to stay clearly within the way that we want to implement our environmental parts of our jobs today, 
at the same time as continuing to build the strategic backbone of the environmental work for the new district. I, I just feel like it'll really help make that clear for people. So thank you. Oh, I'll stop sharing. Ha ha. There we go. Gary, thank you so much. And it was uh, good to be introduced today. Uh, Mr. Owen, assets and liabilities. Yes, good afternoon, all. I have the, the pleasure of um, updating you on the assets and liabilities projects, the uh, work done to date. Um, you've received the um, board packet prior to this meeting, so hopefully you've had a chance to glance at that. Um, I will um, go through, with, with that assumption, I'll go through some of the preliminary information uh, a little more quickly and, and spend more time on the last couple of slides. Yeah, make sure I can share this properly. Are you all able to see the, the slides at this point? All right, Kenny's head is nodding. Again, um, we're talking about assets and liabilities, um, particularly what uh, the work group has done today. Just as, as an update, I'm giving this presentation to all four boards uh, and, and thus the information on this uh, slide. Um, as a reminder, the purpose of this project and the working group is to provide an equitable framework uh, to inventory and value those assets and liabilities um, for the new urban district. Uh, uh, Tom is uh, able to participate as a representative from SDIC and a working group member and uh, is enjoying his time uh, with that, uh, with, with those meetings. We are again, um, giving, uh, benefiting from the facilitation of Kearns and West uh, and so, as well as some technical support from the FCFs group. Um, initially and potentially uh, in, the, in the future here as well. Quick uh, recap of where we are. Uh, we've finished um, um, the work um, to define and value the primary methods um, of, of the assets and liabilities. There'll be another, um, there'll be a little more information uh, regarding the methodology for some of the other considerations, um, but we're in March and uh, I am expecting that uh, you will all see a full draft of this project report uh, in two months from now in May, probably end of May during your uh, individual board meeting um, with the intent to get feedback at that point uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, further deliberation and approval at the end of June. So the last three slides here start off with the following information. This is an overview of the, uh, the table of contents that uh, I was envisioning uh, for this meeting, or sorry, for this, um, this report, rather. Um, it, it, first couple sections are pretty standard. There's an executive overview, which basically has um, meeting, uh, a summary of the information in the other pieces of the report. Um, talk about purpose and background. Um, again, information you've already seen. Um, the third section deals with the duties of the drainage districts. Um, you might recall that there are three legs of the triangle um, that uh, that you as a, as a corporation need to transfer over to the urban district uh, board. And um, those include assets, liabilities, and duties. So we need a summary of the duties associated with um, your corporation. Uh, so the new entity uh, will uh, understand uh, what uh, their responsibilities are moving forward. And Hong's gonna be able to um, pull together that information um, as a draft and you all have a chance to, to take a look at that. Definitions, methodologies, uh, again, this is information we, we talked about uh, back in January for the most part. Um, so there'll be a summary of those. The next two slides um, deal with the, the meat of the, uh, of the report, uh, the assets and liabilities piece in section five represent information primarily for a traditional 
um, or classical definition of assets and liabilities, which focus primarily on accounting. Uh, and so this will be a summary of information from all four special districts um, on their on their books, basically. What are the assets and liabilities identified on their books? Um, it will, <coughs> excuse me, closely mirror the information found in the 2020 financial statements with independent auditors report. Um, the information on the next slide deals has information from the 2019 version of that auditor's report, uh, but the next one will be available before the end of June uh, and hopefully be, um, with your full draft in May. Um, so that's the intent of that particular section. Um, and the final one, other considerations um, deals with um, additional uh, capital investments that we foresee um, the new district uh, new urban district would have to consider. Um, and these come from a variety of sources, including the, the cores, uh, feasibility study recommendations, intangible assets and related to easements, uh, both existing and future, um, other location, other information um, from the, the FEMA levy accreditation projects, um, as well as the 20 year capital improvements uh, both the major capital and sort of operating capital will have to define uh, what that threshold is. Maybe it's a million dollars um, uh, uh, to identify which project should be a, a could be considered a major capital inv investment versus uh, operating capital. Um, as an example of operating capital, uh, that might be um, a, a rebuild of a pump. Uh, or a rehabilitation of one of your um, levy relief wells. So that would be more of an operating capital. Major capital would be the trip weir concept. So um, those two, that type of information be in there. Uh, it will be heavily sourced by your uh, drainage master plan as well as some of our asset management work that we're, um, we're continuing to build on uh, and feed into this, um, into this report. Um, last couple of items under other considerations will include uh, cap capital contributions from other partners. Um, in SDIC's case, that would be the city of Troutdale, um, as well as um, the county and, uh, and the ports. Um, in Pen 1, for instance, the city of Portland has contributed money. Uh, so those are all examples of capital contributions from agency partners. And finally, the, um, there are um, we, sh we feel that there is a need to at least recognize um, needed capital improvements of assets owned by others. Um, so an example of that in SDSC would be um, the culverts under Marine Drive. Um, anecdotal information we have is that those are not in great shape. And so, um, but, but those culverts under Marine Drive are owned by the county. Uh, and so the county would have to take the lead to make any um, uh, repairs or replacements for those, um, but they're critical for our drainage system to perform properly. So we we'll want to make sure that those are identified. So here's a first glance at what the assets and liabilities report section might contain. Um, this is information I took from the uh, 2019 auditor's reports for all four districts. Um, I have, you, can, you can tell there's, um, um, there's more assets or more liabilities depending on the situation uh, and folks like Tom have a, a much better grasp of, of how to um, uh, interpret this information that, than I do. Um, but, and, uh, but I'm gonna provide um, this type of information um, as well as some uh, narrative to help uh, interpret what this is um, for for the readers uh, in the future. Finally, the, uh, here's a glance at what the other considerations might look like. Um, it, it, these are some, uh, it would be broken out by district uh, and as well as the totals. Uh, it's important to note that these are, there are duplicate costs in here. An example would be the, uh, um, S the Sandy pump station um, replacement. Uh, I think in this one, for instance, it's in the major capital improvement plan as well as the fe feasibility study. So that's an example of things that um, I'd have to clean up um, before the full draft is presented to you. So that, that is the information I wanted to present today. Um, are there any questions for, um, for me at this point? Any questions of Bill? 
Ken? No questions. Job, uh, Bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. See Bill, you thanks for your leadership uh, in getting this uh, work group on on track. I mean, we're seems like we're holding to the schedule. So, nice work. Yep, I appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, see, Bill. There we go. Stop sharing. Uh, moving on, uh, Kelly, you're going to talk about the WEIR IGA with the Port of Portland. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Kelly Sherbo here um, in the Associate District Council at MCDD. Um, in your packet, you received a copy of the most recent draft of the WEIR Operation IGA, as well as a resolution um, which uh, adopts the IGA um, or authorizes us to sign it, um, either as is or in the substantial form and substance. Um, and I've already identified a few little edits to make, so um, it will be the latter thing. Um, this is at long last a um, agreement between the port and SDIC regarding um, how we operate the weir as it relates to the port's wetland there. Um, it's a, a little bit unusual because generally with our um, services IGAs, those are directly with MCDD, but in this case, because it related to an asset that is owned by SDIC, we felt that it was more appropriate for the IGA to um, be in SDIC's name. Um, the, the recitals of the IGA just generally track the funding IGA that the port and SDIC signed to fund that weir initially. Um, and it, it formalizes three aspects. First, that flood control is um, the primary goal of the weir. So to the extent that there's any um, conflict of use between the weir uh, supporting the wetland and the weir needing to be used for flood control, that flood control would um, would be the primary um, the primary use. Second, it establishes a method for requesting and compensating SDIC to go out and raise or lower the weir to support the port's um, hydrology plan, which is required for their wetland permit. Um, and it also uh, back pays for a few instances that we, um, where we went out to do that on behalf of the port. Um, and then it, the, thirdly, it provides ongoing support of the port's wetland mitigation plan for that site. So as they need to update it um, in order to keep compliant with their permit, that we would work with them um, to make sure that they can do that and, um, and that everything is still working well for the flood control use of the weir. Um, so you have before you a resolution um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you have about the IGA or um, anything else. Thanks very much, Kelly. Ken, Tanny, any, any questions of Kelly? No, just a thank you uh, for all your help on getting the two parties to agree. I didn't have a, a role in this because of the apparent conflict, but uh, I appreciate it from the, the port side. And I think it's great, you know, that we've acknowledged that the, the weir is for flood protection, number one, and then ports beneficial use, number two. So thank you. Danny? Well written. And we're charging into water plants. I get it. Okay. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> um, and I believe that um, your uh, complex counsel, Brian Sheets, has also received a copy of this. Um, and so we'll be requesting his signature on there as well um, to approve it and uh, sufficiency as to Kelly, uh, the form. Kelly and Brian, I, I want to make sure our IGA with MCDD is inclusive enough to require MCDD to to fulfill these responsibilities we're taking on. Because uh, I just want to make sure our, our M SDIC's IJ with MCDD has the uh, authority to direct MCD to, to do this work and hold MCD accountable to meet the requirements of the Port of Portland's uh, needs. So as long as we have capacity and authority in our current IGA with MCD, that if you can just clarify that. Yeah, I think the um, the administrative section of the IGA as between um, MCDD and SDIC 
um, NCDD is sort of functioning as a subcontractor. Um, and, and that's the way that a lot of our interdistrict relationships work. Um, and then I, I think that to the extent MCDD did not have capacity to fulfill the requirements of this IGA, that it would they would have a duty to notify SDIC um, so that SDIC could find a different um, subconsultant to provide that, if that makes sense. So, so I just want to make sure SDIC has SDIC has assurance we can fulfill the terms of this IGA we're entering into with the Port of Portland. I just don't want to extend a, an IG obligation with not having a vehicle to execute. So that's that's just my only concern. Yeah, no, we feel like this fits within, um, th within the obligation between SDIC and MCDD. Brian, do you have any comments to share or any concerns? I've gone over the the uh, agreement and uh, look forward to seeing the uh, revised version to make sure that uh, it meets with the expectations of the board. Okay, so it sounds like we're still working on a final version, so we'll be refraining refraining from a vote today. Or how's this work? I, I would like to pass the resolution today if that's possible. Um, it's not going to change significantly in its content from what you see. Um, I can identify, I think there's four edits. Um, so in recital J, the word location is going to be replaced with local. That's just a typo. Um, we're going to change the effective date to be after the point at which the board authorizes this IGA. Um, there was a typo in section 3.2A where um, it was written SD instead of SDIC. And then um, in section 3.4A, we're just going to put in a clause about that um, the rates may be adjusted from time to time. Thanks, Kelly, I appreciate that. Uh, any uh, further discussion on this matter? Do I hear a motion to approve resolution number R-2021-03-01, approving an intergovernment agreement with the Port of Portland for services relating to the trip flow control structure? And on, on this particular one, since it pertains to my employer, I'd rather not, I'd rather abstain from voting, but um, will we be able to do that if we don't have a quorum? We're okay. We have two voting. Two. We'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your recognizing that, Ken. So, so I will make the motion to approve the resolution as I, uh, as I read previously. I would certainly like to see the finished product or whatever we're actually agreeing to at some point. Sure, I can definitely send out the um, the revised version with those edits that I discussed with you. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Moving on, item F, PG Blue Lake substation. Did, was there a vote? I... Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. So good. we had a motion and a second uh, a roll call vote between Tanny Staffenson. Aye. Tanny Staffenson, roll call vote. Uh, I vote aye. And Tom Hansel votes aye. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. And uh, Ken Anderton abstained due to conflicts. Mr. Owen, back up for Blue Lake substation. That's correct. Let me uh, share my screen one more time just for reference purposes. Um, are you all able to see uh, the graphic here? Thumbs up, all right, great. So let me zoom in just a little bit more so you can see what we're talking about. Um, so uh, the area that uh, we're focused on is up here, right uh, next to Salmon Creek. And uh, the port's 
trip site is across Marine Drive. This is Marine Drive. Um, the cross levy, MCD, SDSE cross levy is right here. So it's pretty close um, to the northwest corner of your district, uh, of your corporation, excuse me. Um, and there's a culvert underneath Marine Drive, the county owns, that allows Salmon Creek to flow from, from east to west. This site um, where these green little uh, triangles are shown um, is an area that we maintain and uh, have maintained for decades. Um, and um, we do that because we always want to have at least one side uh, of the open channel available for us uh, to, make, to access the, the creek uh, for maintenance purposes. So, um, so and for, as I said, for very many, many years, uh, we've been doing that uh, in this vicinity. And uh, in doing, right, if, since the mid 90s, uh, approximately, um, this is, site is now owned by PGE and this is where their, um, their substation is for that particular area. So uh, in, um, I believe it was September of this, late September of this year, as we were finishing up our mowing activities, um, our staff went in and, uh, um, and, and mowed this area like we've, we've done every year. Um, but what we find out later is that what we mowed down, uh, it's not just tree as uh, grass, sadly, it's also um, some mitigation shrubs. Um, that PGE had planted in this area, unbeknownst of, uh, of, of, uh, of our activities in this vicinity. Their mitigation here was done um, in response to a project they had to um, upgrade their transmission system uh, from the Blue Lake Station uh, and south uh, down Blue Lake Road. To do that, they had to cross over um, a series of a, a small um, forested area and took down several trees in order to do that. So as you all know, well know, the, um, environmental permits require mitigation when you're removing trees. And this is what PGE decided to do. Um, I won't go into the details per se, um, but uh, we ended up mowing it down. MCD staff mowed it down. Um, um, without knowing that uh, there was um, new plants there. Um, and it took a little while for PGE to understand um, who had done that work. And we eventually, they eventually figured that out um, and we started conversations with them. Um, and um, they had asked uh, that, the, that we pay um, just over $18,000 in mitigation costs and damages uh, from this site. Uh, and um, we submitted that, at least initially, through uh, as, the SDI, as a potential SDIC claim, uh, but then were, um, uh, were corrected that uh, since it was MCD staff that did this work, uh, it would be an MCDD claim instead. So we made that correction. Uh, it took a little more time from SDAO um, to collect um, uh, the documentation needed for this, and ultimately, um, we um, SDO paid that claim last month. So PGE is, um, uh, has their money back, um, but still needs a mitigation site to address this, uh, 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 to their tree removal. So um, that takes me to the next um, point of, uh, of this update uh, of what, what do we do uh, moving forward? Um, because what we don't want to do is have this happen again, because this is a critically important area for our drainage system. It's just downstream, upstream, excuse me, at the Sandy Pump Station. Uh, we know that this area gets, um, uh, gets um, blockages from down trees and other, uh, other things happening here. And uh, we do dredging operations here periodically over the years. So it's absolutely critical we do uh, work, be able to have access here. So a um, couple things are going on. One, we're working with um, PGE to find alternative mitigation sites. Um, there's a, one of them is, for them um, is, to, um, is to plant along the bank of the creek. That's not our first choice. Um, that um, all that does is add some more um, vegetation. We have to uh, 
uh, work around or through um, in order to get access to the creek. Um, and I'm just nervous we're gonna end up damaging more than, um, than they're actually they're putting in. So that's not my first choice. Um, but we, with Carrie's help, uh, we're looking at other sites uh, for uh, PGE. Uh, one is actually uh, on the edge of the, of the trip property, uh, just across Marine Drive here on the north side of the creek, um, north side of Marine Drive, excuse me. Um, and um, there's also another site, uh, a couple other options on Blue Lake substation. Um, but um, we're working with, as I said, we're working with BGE and the city of Fairview who issued the permit to find alternative sites that would minimize uh, our impact here. So that's one thing that's happening. Uh, the second thing is uh, there are two easement uh, efforts going on um, for us. One uh, is a more is a formal easement with the Port of Portland uh, to get access to this site. Um, typically, uh, we don't our crews don't go through the PGE property main gate through this access road here. Hopefully, you can see this uh, cursor movement. But instead, we come in further west, and the, the Port of Portland has um, some property in just uh, north of the creek and west of uh, above the culverts. Um, there's an access road there, and we've historically used that access road in order to get in there. Um, yeah, and hopefully, uh, if um, we're able to, it's a really small piece of land, uh, but for hopefully if we're able to get the easement there, it would at least give the port uh, a flag if PGE or someone else um, comes across and said, can we do something about this access road? Because part of this mitigation, P what PGE did is uh, connected with the port and placed a couple of huge boulders um, blocking that access road. So people, um, just you know, normal um, laypersons couldn't just, or members of the public can just go in there and, and drive over their new mitigation site. Um, so that's, we're hopeful that uh, that easement uh, conversation will, um, uh, will yield uh, an access agreement, uh, easement in that area. The other, and the main, access, main easement we wanna get is on PGE property for this area where we maintain the, um, maintain this, the creek. So it's not only in the areas where these green triangles are, but also um, over, the, over the creek itself. So um, and this would be a maintenance agreement um, that we would have with, uh, with PGE for, the, for, for that purpose. We're also um, looking at uh, our own procedures of how we do inspections of sites before we end up mowing. Um, there's already some in place, um, but they apparently just weren't thorough enough in this case um, and um, in, in, in making improvements of that end. So there are a number of prongs um, uh, in the fire right now to try to um, improve our processes and, and, and legal authority to do work in this area um, and to avoid the situation in the future, not this site, but other sites as well. So right, the last piece of information I'll, I'll comment on um, is uh, in our development review process, um, we actually worked very, um, worked quite a bit with BGE um, to deal with uh, a new pole they put in right next to Blue Lake Road right here. I'm sort of circling with my, my mouse. Um, and, but that development review focused primarily on the impact of the levee system um, because it was close enough to the levees that uh, the Corps of Engineers had to be involved to get approval here. So that went through with enough changes to their design. But what uh, didn't trigger to me is is there uh, easement, do we have appropriate easements for the rest of the property that's associated with that, that work? Um, and so um, that's something else that we're putting in as a, as a trigger for us to look at the entire property uh, for potential easement needs um, as uh, development reviews come through. Um, so um, that is also in, in play. So a lot of words. Um, let me know uh, if you have any questions or comments about that. Um, it's not something that uh, honestly is very enjoyable for us to, to go through and we don't want to be going through this in the future, but um, we're, we're trying to, to make the best of it. 
Thanks, Bill. Any discussion, Tanny or Ken? I guess, Bill, um, in the future, for for anyone that plans a mitigation site that's also in close proximity or within easements, um, is that going to get picked up somehow in a development review? I hope so, Ken. Um, you know, sometimes permits sort of slip through. Usually what happens is, well, we all, Troutdale is very good, um, uh, and generally Gresham, who I think does the work for um, Fairview, are really good about uh, notifying us if there's any development activity uh, that overlaps our district boundaries. We pay attention primarily to areas, that are types of development that um, involve excavation at all, because that normally impacts the, the areas that we work on. Um, but, um, you know, for areas that uh, we're just talking about uh, mitigation, um, that is uh, something we don't normally see very often where there's the permits just for mitigation purposes. Um, so we, we just have to be careful, uh, honestly, uh, as those permits go through uh, and making sure that uh, we think about the things I was mentioning earlier uh, to, uh, make sure we have appropriate easements in this area. Honestly, those type of permits are pretty rare. Um, certainly mitigation is not rare. That happens quite a bit, uh, but mitigation just, a permit just for mitigation would be, uh, uh, would be pretty infrequent. Yeah, I, I think it's just something we should try to, if we can keep track of, you know, um, on the, not related to SDAC, but MCDD, uh, prologis is development of uh, Broadmoor, so. Yeah, um, so we, we're all over that one, by the way. Okay. Uh, so um, in that situation, um, we the drainage master plan and MCDD actually identified a couple of improvements in that area. And so we're working with the developer there to incorporate those improvements. So in that situation, you're right, it's similar um, to the scenario you're, you're bringing up. Um, but yeah, in that, in that example, we're, we're, uh, we're on top of it. Thanks, that's it. the extent of my comments. Bill, curious, typically would you acquire an access up agreement for these properties where we don't have easements? So in this case, did your crew, did the crew, Randy's crews contact PGE prior to them entering this property? Uh, the short answer is no, uh, we did not. Um, in part because past practices for decades has, has um, ingrained in us that we don't need to ask for that type of permission. Um, but um, as that's benefited because um, probably because the landowners haven't changed over time, right? But in this case, it did. And um, that history is lost when new property owners come on board um, and you know, district staff changes. So that's why I think adding um, this overlay of, of, uh, of new legal agreements is going to be benef not only benefits our district, but benefits those property owners as they ch as the property changes hands over, over the years. So have you suspended entering private property without proper notification or permissions or are you, no, if you know um, the property owner, you go on, I, I, yep. I'm just not sure. Yeah, that's generally the case. If we know the property owner, we we just go on, um, and we're not proactively um, seeking easements um, outside of the development review process. Um, during development reviews, you know, this is maybe the exception. We are seeking those. Um, past staff have um, leveraged their interpretation of the ORS statutes on what we can and can't do about accessing private property. Uh, and so they felt that these type of easements weren't as important uh, because they were covered by the, what they felt was the ORS uh, statutes. Um, you know, current staff feel that uh, we, we need this additional um, overlay. Yeah, I think whatever uh, you're, your attorney recommends, uh, you know, I'll let Hong advise uh, the operations what they can and shouldn't do. So, 
Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just add with respect to this area, it's, it's more, even though um, there is not a written easement, the fact that staff has access or the ops team have access in the past, one can argue there's equitable or prescriptive easement that is in place um, that is representative of historical practices. But certainly to Bill's point, um, the more documentation we have, the, the better we're going to be. And we can map it out on our GIS so that uh, future, future ops teams members don't have to question. Thanks. Thank you. I think that's it, Bill. Thank you so much for the update. Yep. Thank you for your time. I hope that's the last occurrence. Okay, moving on to item G, the 40 mile loop trail, kind of some background. Uh, is Kevin with us? Yep. Yes, I am. Right. Um, so then when we started the uh, SDSC segment of the 40 mile loop, it is just an extension, uh, multiple uh, recreational paths uh, along the Columbia and elsewhere. Um, so we started the SDSC one in April of 2018, uh, and it started with initial conversations with Robin Ford and ODOT and uh, firm uh, Harper, Howell, Peterson, Ray Ellis. Uh, we were working with Kim Shira for a very long time on the majority of that. Uh, and right at the end, uh, it was transferred over to Peter Cotton. Uh, we included support on a lot of the communications, uh, particularly Ronnie McCaffrey. Um, and then we were speaking from the beginning uh, to ODOT, and we were talking with their ODOT's local ATC phase on Reef and Jackie. Um, they performed a full site survey, including wetlands and other areas uh, around everywhere they were planning on constructing the trail. Uh, they did geotechnical explorations and they created uh, engineering analyses to demonstrate that what they were constructing would not be detrimental to the federal project, which means necessary for their submission to the Corps of Engineers. Um, and then the project was delayed for a very long time in the review uh, by the Corps of Engineers because at one point in time when the feasibility started, uh, they stopped approving any developments at any of the sites that the Corps was looking at for feasibility studies just to make sure that they weren't going to create problems for themselves and approving the projects that they had to take out later. Um, ultimately, they decided that this would not detrimentally impact uh, any of the proposed work of the feasibility study and actually complete some of the work feasibility study would have addressed, uh, particularly the segment uh, from in SDIC from about the pump station down to Sundial Road uh, that does not have any type of gravel or paved path on the levee crest. And so this adds that in for free uh, to SDIC. Uh, so it's a net benefit. It helps us with flood fighting to be able to access that uh, in the RIP in the past. Uh, the rehabilitation inspection program from the Corps of Engineers that addressed that two track road there between that segment between the pump station and sundial. This had rutting and this will add a paved section that um, ultimately we got approval from the Corps of Engineers in November of 2020. Uh, and MCD then, through our normal procedures after receiving approval from the Corps, we wrote our approval and gave that to uh, the board and HHPR. That pass it on uh, to other agencies like NODOT. Um, and then we found out in, right at the end of January uh, this year that there were some condemnation proceedings between NODOT and George Pacific related to this. Uh, they, ODOT had been able to obtain easements, you know, on either side of the property owned by Georgia Pacific, but not from Georgia Pacific. Uh, it sounds, I assume they just don't want the bike path to be uh, improved there and encourage more pedestrian traffic. Um, we shared that information with you in our last board meeting. Um, this is the board of course has chosen to have Brian and Sheets represent them in this matter. Um, and then just uh, as I was actually writing this last Thursday, we received a notice uh, that 
ODOT has left funds for Georgia Pacific uh, to take as payment uh, for taking that land in the state. In that letter uh, says that they took ownership on March 5th, uh, so last Friday. Uh, this is a project map um, where they will be tying into the uh, recreational path just uh, on the north side of Blue Lake Park. Uh, come across Marine Drive with a, a signal uh, pedestrian walkway. We'll get onto the uh, MCDP levy at Chinook Marine Landing and eventually meet up to the SDIC levy system across and then run just, it'll run south of the road right now that runs to Georgia Pacific and Iron Horse. Um, yeah, but north of the pump station, so just on that side hill, a portion of the levee, and then eventually just burns on the levee crest. Uh, and so in that area where it's running on the, the levee crest, that's the property that is owned by Georgia Pacific, um, right after you get past the pump station. And so you can see that the, the permanent easement that they wanted uh, in the plan set is very narrow. It goes from here to here. Uh, it's and they had a temporary construction easement. Uh, this is one side of Sandy's easement where they have drawn the other, they haven't shown the other one, but if you read our original easement, I think it's 100 feet to either side from the center of the crest. So if they needed to show it for the project purposes, there would be another easement line out of Sandy's easement up to the north. But that's pretty much the history we have on this. Hey, Kevin, this is Brian. Hey, hey so uh, am I correct that the development review for this uh, has been submitted and is it complete? It is complete, yeah. We ran it through our standard of pre-processes and uh, we have given them uh, the letters of approval that they need to. Okay, that's great. Yeah, um, I was hoping you might be able to send me a copy of that. Is that possible? Yes. Okay, great. And then there was also the Corps of Engineers uh, finding uh, that it's not going to be impacting their projects as well. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know if there was an official um, form for that, but I can I can show their 408 uh, the 408 decision. Typically, it won't talk probably the 408 won't mention the feasibility study, but it will mention that they don't find that the project is detrimental uh, to the federal project. Okay, great. And if you also have a copy of that, I'd, I'd like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And then also, are would you be available uh, maybe later this week to to uh, just sort of talk about any sort of uh, any anything else that comes up as I'm researching this? I'm happy to do that, just as long as it's uh, amenable to Peggy and Hom. Yep. Yep. I'll definitely link them in on any sort of requests I got for that that kind of stuff. But uh, in the interim, uh, right now, the only ask I'm hearing is that you want our approval and uh, on behalf of SDIC for this project, and then also uh, the 408 from the Corps of Engineers. Yep. Are there any other questions on this? Any questions of Kevin or Brian? Kev Kevin, I was just curious, you know, if we're asked to increase the height of the, the levy at some future date, who's liable for the, the, will the trail be in our way, the pathway, a paved trail, and who's responsible to replace that if we have to put additional fill? Are we, are we protected there? Uh, I wouldn't be qualified to answer who uh, in that regard. Uh, I would say that your levy is very high now. Um, compared to many other districts in that uh, there's a lot of other levies we'd like to raise before we'd like to raise yours, but um, I, I don't know who would be responsible if we wanted to raise that levy, uh, if we would have to reconstruct the path around that. I'll just, I'll just add um, if it's under the agreement that we had with the various stakeholders um, in terms of um, the P party's responsibilities, I can um, add that we made sure in that agreement that flood control 
takes precedent. So um, to the extent that there is a need to change the recreational uh, path itself, um, I would hope that they would look back at that agreement to make to acknowledge that there's the, the flood control precedent. Um, given that we have a levy easement there that predates anything else that's going in today. Yeah, thanks, Hong. I mean, this, this kind of goes in the same environment, the environmental discussion and the recreation discussion. You know, our first priority is the, the levy and the integrity of, you know, flood, flood safety. So, so thanks for uh, reinforcing that. Hong, which, uh, which agreement is that? Uh, it was the 40 mile trail IGA. It's a, it's an agreement that uh, reflects the, the inner working among the parties that um, governs the relationship between, I, I don't know, there's probably 10 different uh, regional parties associated with that agreement. Ken, Ken, Ken was, is aware of it. It's with ODOT, Metro, us. Is that also the funding plan? So it, yes, it dis it discuss funding. So I think that was the funding agreement, Brian. The, it's a complicated mix of funding, um, as all all projects seem to be nowadays. But it's Federal Highway Administration funding, and it's filtered through Metro and ODOT's the constructor, and the port is the project manager. So, but probably probably would be good if we could get Brian a copy of that, if if uh, we have it available. Yeah, if, if you do have a, uh, the ability to share that with me, I'd really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we, we can try to find it. I'm, I'm sure we have, have it. <laughs> I'm looking to Kevin. It's been, it's been years now that I've, I've worked on it. So oh, great. Uh, we can find it. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, Tom, I think you're on mute. I, I was. There you Thank go. you for the reminder. So any other questions of Kevin? Okay. Thank you so much, Kevin. Appreciate it. Yep. So I don't have the... Uh, so we're going to go into executive session. I don't have the language that moves us into that status. Is there... Somebody um, could help with that. Is there any specific message we need to say? Yes, and I don't know. And Hong, I, you could advise me. It might be easiest if we, since the only other item is new business, to uh, go through that in, for a couple of minutes. So then we can excuse all our staff, and you guys can finish out the meeting um, with Brian on your own. Uh, if, as long as that's okay, if we can just go to new business and then do the executive session at the end. I think yeah. the only concern would be if they need to make a decision yeah. after um, that they would need to do that in open session. And so we probably would want at least somebody to hang out and be able to record that. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be asking for uh, something at the end to come back into regular session. Okay. Um, then I guess, do you want, um, I can send everyone to the waiting room and uh, you all can let me know. I can make um, Tom the host of the meeting and then you can bring us out of the waiting room when you guys are ready, if that works. That works for me. Okay. That works for me. And then a question on my participation since I Port has ties to this. Um, I abstained from the last conversation. Do you want me to stay out of the, the room? No, I, no, I mean, you do represent uh, your landowner that has appointed you here, and I don't believe that you have particular financial gain to get out of this project uh, individually, so uh, I don't see a problem with that. Okay, I just like to disclose that my employer is, uh, is sponsoring the, the pro project, um, but I as an elected board member, I keep SDIC's uh, interest in mind when making decisions. So just wanted to clarify that. Great, thank you. And I also wanted to check on my role as executive director to be participating in the executive session. Uh, you can, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just didn't want to make it clear. Thank you.
Hey, Emily. Uh -huh. to, to exit this uh, session, I just go into breakout. Which what which action do I need to do? You know, well, usually I can send everyone to a um, to. Oh, I think it's because I made you the host already. Um, okay, so I should have done this first. Um, if you, each of us at the corner of our photo has uh, like an ellipses and, and if you click on that, it should be able, you should be able to send people to the waiting room. And um, so you'll need to do that for the staff that you want to leave the room and then also um, if you want to stop the recording during for the executive session, you'll need to do that as well. Yeah, I'll be I'll be re recording this. Okay. Okay, so Kristen is going to waiting room. Perfect. Kelly goes to waiting room. Correct. It's yeah. Yeah, I'm in the waiting room. Or send me. <laughs> Hong is in the waiting room. And then Emily, you go in the waiting room, huh? Yes. Sir. I'm still here. I assume I need to do mine again. Yeah. Yours is not. Let me see if I can move you up here. If it doesn't work in the next 10 seconds, I can just log off. Yeah, I'm not seeing yours under put in waiting room. All right, uh, well, I will. Put sorry, Kelly. In. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, we're in the executive session in a quasi environment. All right, fair enough. Uh, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So we're gonna move, move into executive session under ORS 192.6602H uh, to consult with legal counsel regarding the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or lit litigation likely to be filed. So- I will make you host, Emily. Okay, yeah, I got it. Now we're up and running again. So I, uh, I just wanna uh, reinforce uh, that we're in support of uh, our position to maintain our current easements regarding the uh, associated condemnation that's in front of us today with uh, the GP property. And not lose any of our positions that we hold today. Sure. Or, any other matters on this topic? Uh, and then Tom, you're gonna be the point person. Yes, and uh, just for clarification, uh, in support of our uh, council's effort on this matter, I will serve as point person to uh, provide uh, feedback and advice to Brian as needed, and then we'll bring to the board as needed to get further direction. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So I guess we're coming out of an executive session and returning to the SDIC March 9th uh, meeting. And I think we're just finishing up with uh, any staff reports, Peggy. Yeah, I can make it quick. Thanks. You can hear it in your voice. Um, I just want to give you a couple updates. One, um, we have gotten all the applications. We got over 30 applications for the ED position. Um, we are going through the first round of screening now. Um, as I've indicated before, there'll be representation from MCDD and the new district um, for that selection committee and um, we're narrowing it down, we hope to eight, with a set of interviews in March 17th and 18th, and a final interview at the end of the month on the 31st with an opportunity for staff to have an, a chance to also meet with the, maybe the top two candidates. Um, we have submitted the letter for um, Colin and Mark and Evan, we submitted a letter and financial certification to the core this last week. Packages anticipated to go to DC this the, the end of this month. 
Um, just a couple of legislative updates. Um, we are going forward. Um, we met, there was a hearing of the Senate Committee of Housing and Development. Why that committee, I don't know. Um, for Senate Bill 622, which addresses the $10 million um, grant program for um, four levy systems throughout the state with 60% of that going to the more rural communities. 47 and four more urban, 40% for urban districts. It went well. Shirley Craddock did a excellent um, presentation along with Mark Landauer and Lou Fredericks. Um, we also met with Speaker Kotek on Friday of last week, which included um, Michael Jordan, um, Mark Landauer, Evan, and myself to talk about a, the the two million that we're kind of looking for with that new district that's a little bit under the radar at this point. Meeting went well. I think she's very impressed with the work that's been done to date um, on that new district and certainly understands the, the lift that's still ahead. And um, she suggested we do some outreach, which I'm going to leave for Evan to probably give us an update further on down the road of reaching out to the legislators that are impacted by our districts and um, seek some additional support for head nodding. Um, <clears throat> we're also meeting with, we're meeting with Chris Cummings on, so I, there was, a, let's say this, no one threw up when we asked for the $2 million and, and there wasn't even a <gasps> kind of thing. So I feel real, I feel good. I feel, I, I feel I feel guardedly optimistic. Um, we may not see two, but we'll see. I, I'm hoping we see some. Um, but we also will be meeting with Chris Cummings this week to talk about the half million dollar grant for the last from this point for this biennium, and because um, we will not have spent all that money, and we're going to ask for an extension so that we have an opportunity to do that. Um, also, a couple things that you may be interested in um, for the urban flood safety, the urban district, let's go there. Um, a new member was introduced, um, Eric Moeller from the city of Fairview. He's replacing Mike Weatherby. Um, and as well as because Mike Weatherby was a vice chair, we also went through the process of a of selecting a vice chair, and it's um, Steve Fancher, which I think is going to be a great ad. Um, and then um, we've had some initial discussion. We had to go through a budget amendment process under the public budget law. So we had our first meeting this on March 1. We'll follow it up on the March 15th meeting. We've introduced um, some of the initial um, financial policies we need to get done before the budget's adopted for the new district. And um, we are getting our mission vision value process kicked off. And we've gotten um, two proposals for the financial modeling. So we're rocking and rolling um, and uh, keep moving. So I'm going to be running and passing that baton. That's all, how I, it's work. <laughs> all I can say is, wow, you're, you and your team are doing a lot. That team is incredible. You're going to miss this. I know when you step <laughs> out. <laughs> I am, but I don't think it's nothing. Um, a little mar few margaritas won't help. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we're still a few months away. You're still stuck with me a little while longer. Thank you again for your uh, leadership and moving moving this forward. Tammy, yeah. anything before we adjourn? Adjourn. We have March 9th, March 9th SDIC meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all. Have a great day.